be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. Bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell. Be thy events wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. That quote was from Hamlet, a play written by William Shakespeare. It is famous for many things, but especially for its contemplation about life after death. But humanity's quest for answers from beyond the grave began thousands of years before then. There are ancient records of necromancy and conjuring of spirits, but it is possible, in fact quite likely, that this supernatural practice went back since the beginning of time. What happens to our essence when our body is permanently laid to rest? It is a profound question that has been asked since the beginning of existential consciousness. The mid-19th to early 20th century brought a surge of new questions regarding the afterlife. It was the Wild West of invention, and a time when science and religion, superstition and enlightenment battled for people's confidence. Changes in science, culture, and religion combined together to create the perfect storm for a new, fantastical, yet comforting new movement, spiritualism. The term spiritualism can loosely be summed up to say it is the belief that ghosts can talk to the living through psychic mediums. During this time, the Western world was facing decreased family size, increased illnesses from travelers and migration, strengthening scientific reasoning, and the decline of Christian conviction. All of this together brought a weakening confidence in the outcome of life's only guarantee and the greatest mystery, death. Spiritualism gave people a sense of comfort for their losses and bravery to face the great unknown of the afterlife. Seance participation especially spiked during the Civil War and World War I. Spiritualism tended to promote the idea of a tiered heaven in which everyone would be accepted, but not everyone would receive the same heavenly blessings in the afterlife. This movement is sometimes called modern spiritualism, because the act of speaking with the dead has been around for thousands of years, in many, if not most, cultures across the globe. One story many Jews and Christians will be familiar with is in the book of 1 Samuel in the Bible. In this story, King Saul was severely distraught over the strength David was amassing among the people. In fear and anguish, Saul called upon the witch of Endor to raise the spirit of the prophet Samuel from the grave, in hopes that Samuel's wisdom would help the king in his desperate hour. The witch, called an Eshet Bailarov, conjured up the spirit of Samuel as requested. However, Samuel was outraged by Saul's arrogance to call him back from the grave. The sin of Saul did not pay off well, and the news that Samuel had to share would only confirm Saul's worst fears. Samuel informed the king that he would indeed be stripped of his rule because he had failed to completely destroy the Amalekites as commanded by God. Saul was killed in battle shortly after receiving this devastating news from beyond the grave. This is just one story out of thousands, as calling upon the dead is an ancient and global practice. In the 18th century, Dr. Franz Anton Mesmer developed a theory that a universal magnetic fluid permeates the body, and the flow of this fluid could be the cause and the cure of many illnesses. Dr. Mesmer put his patients in trances, and then attempted to manipulate their magnetic fluid with magnets to help cure them of various problems. It is from Mesmer's work that we get the terms mesmerizing and animal magnetism. Mesmer believed his work only involved patients' magnetic fluid and not their souls or other spirits. Despite this, his mesmerism eventually became a part of the growing mysticism flourishing across the world. The spiritualist movement benefited heavily from the use of trances and mesmerism. Even with the latest 21st century research, consciousness is still not entirely understood. 200 years ago, when even less was known, there was much debate about mesmeric sleep-waking, hypnotism, second personalities, demonic possession, and mediumship. 
entertainment, religion, and science mixed, mingled, and clash as people scramble to define the unknown. It is generally said that modern spiritualism officially began in 1848 in Hydesville, New York. There, the Fox sisters, Margaret 15 and Kate 12, began to hear knocking noises in their house. They investigated the sounds and came to believe that they were coming from a spirit. They claimed they learned to communicate and that the spirit would use knocking to answer questions. Later, Margaret would introduce this ability to her older sister, Leah. People became quite interested in the sisters' mediumship, and they would perform demonstrations on stage and toured with P.T. Barnum. Spiritualism spread across America and into Europe. By 1850, Andrew Jackson Davis wrote his first volume in The Great Harmonia, being a philosophical revelation of the natural, spiritual, and celestial universe. The spiritualist movement often embraced Davis's teachings, but the application was not universal. Davis was heavily influenced by Emanuel Swedenborg, a mathematician and mystic who claimed to have visited heaven and other planets while in trances. Spiritualism began with no leaders or institutions, and even when they did emerge, their influence over the movement as a whole was minor. Spiritualism was proudly individualistic, but it could not escape all manner of order and regulation. In 1865, the first national spiritualist organization began in Philadelphia called the American Association of Spiritualists. Spiritualist mediumship was the first step in Madame Helena Blavatsky's long career into the occult. Later, she would say that spiritualism was not false, but that it was limited in its understanding of the true metaphysics. In 1875, Blavatsky co-founded the Theosophical Society, which delved deeper into the occult and esoteric practices and is still around today. The flexibility of beliefs and a lack of concrete doctrine in spiritualism allowed practitioners to choose their relationship with Christianity. While some spiritualists used their practice to separate from the church, others would claim that spiritualism could reside alongside Christianity and went as far to say that Jesus was a medium. Conversely and unsurprisingly, some critics associated mediumship with demon possession. With the burgeoning science of electricity, it was proposed that women were better suited for mediumship because they were negatively charged, allowing them to attract positively charged spirits, as opposed to men who were thought to be positively charged. Unfortunately for them, however, women were also more likely to be accused of hysteria and mental instability over men. Psychoanalysts began to attempt to explain the phenomenon in medical and mental health terms, which led to the institutionalization of some mediums. As with all other areas of life, the expanding science of the day took to investigating this new phenomenon. The Society for Psychical Research was founded in England in 1882. Some of its members included Mark Twain, Lewis Carroll, and Sir Oliver Lodge. Three years later, its sister organization opened in America. In the early 20th century, a new feature of spiritualism began to appear, ectoplasm. Also called teleplasm, ectoplasm would be produced out of a medium's body during seances. The Encyclopedia Britannica defines ectoplasm in occultism as Quote, a mysterious, usually light-colored, viscous substance that is said to exude from the body of a spiritualist medium in trance, and may then take the shape of a face, a hand, or a complete body. It is normally visible only in the darkened atmosphere of a seance. Ectoplasm is said to be the substance involved in the materialization of spiritual bodies, and the levitation of material objects is commonly explained by the gradual buildup of columns of ectoplasm underneath the objects. At the end of the seance, the ectoplasm disappears, allegedly by returning into the medium's body. End quote. One can clearly see why doubt is raised over the authenticity of such apparitions. However, some mediums were able to stump even some scientists as well. Marjorie Mina Crandon conducted a seance in front of several scientists and was able to produce ectoplasm that was impressive enough for the physicist Sir Oliver Lodge to say that ectoplasm should be studied by biologists. As science was used to study and sometimes discredit the spiritualist movement, science was also used to help fool audiences, such as with double exposure photography. Using double exposure, many people claimed to be able to photograph the dead. One such charlatan was William H. Mumler who was brought to court over his photographic fraud. Both the critics and proponents of spiritualism came from all walks of life, with some people taking a surprising stance on the subject. Harry Houdini, the famous and talented magician, was very critical about spiritualism and mediumship. 
In addition to his own career in entertainment and illusions, for which he never claimed to have supernatural powers, he spent a lot of time and energy devoted to esoteric studies. His research led him to conclude that spiritualism had no concrete evidence at all. Quote, I've spent a goodly part of my life in study and research. During the last 30 years, I have read every single piece of literature on the subject of spiritualism that I could. I have accumulated one of the largest libraries in the world on psychic phenomena, spiritualism, magic, witchcraft, demonology, evil spirits, etc. Some of the material going back as far as 1489. And I doubt if anyone in the world has so complete a library on modern spiritualism. But nothing I have ever read concerning the so-called spiritualistic phenomena has impressed me as being genuine. It is true that some of the things I read seemed mystifying, but I question if they would be were they to be reproduced under different circumstances, under test conditions, and before expert mystifiers and open-minded committees. Mine has not been an investigation of a few days or weeks or months, but one that has extended over 30 years, and in 30 years I have not found one incident that savored of the genuine. If there had been any real unalloyed demonstration to work on, one that did not reek of fraud, one that could not be produced by earthly powers, then there would be something for a foundation. But up to the present time, everything I've investigated has been the result of deluded brains, or those which were too actively and intensely willing to believe. End quote. Houdini even demonstrated how mediums could produce spirit hands that often made their appearance in seances, and used double exposure photography to make an image of him with the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. Despite his strong disbelief and active debunking of spiritualism, he was able to maintain his friendship with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the famed author of Sherlock Holmes and a strong believer in spiritualism. However, that friendship ended in 1924 when Houdini published a book disproving spiritualism. Additionally, he had told his wife Bess that when he died, he would try to contact her through a medium with the secret phrase, Rosabelle Believe. After his death in 1926, Bess was never able to hear him speak from the other side through a medium. Even when spiritualism was going strong, it was still publicly known that there were frauds afoot. In 1907, Dr. Hugh R. Moore, Reverend of the Church of Harmonial Philosophy, was convicted of practicing fortune-telling in Los Angeles without a license. This was after he had to leave New York when he was discovered to be a fraud and the tricks of his seances were exposed. In the late 19th century, a new tool for speaking with the dead, called a talking board, became popular and continues to be used today. It is typically known as a Ouija board. The general practice is two or more people sit at a board with the alphabet written on it, and a small movable pointer called a planchette is placed on top. The players lightly put their fingers on the planchette and invite spirits to use their hands to move the planchette around the board, spelling out messages. In 1890, talking boards began to be commercially manufactured in Baltimore, Maryland by the Kennard Novelty Company and was given the name Ouija Boards. In 1892, William Fold, once a stockholder in the Kennard Novelty Company, successfully applied for a patent to make improvements to the talking board. William Fold then opened a company with his brother Isaac, called Isaac Fold and Brother. Kennard Novelty Company changed their name to Ouija Novelty Company and granted the Folds permission to manufacture the Ouija boards for three years. After the three years were up, the Ouija Novelty Company renewed their manufacturing partnership with William Fold alone, leaving Isaac out of the deal. Isaac would go on to create his own version of the spirit device, called the Oriole Talking Board. Other manufacturers also produced talking boards under different names, such as Volo, Esperito, and Igili. However, Ouija is the most widely known name and is currently manufactured by Hasbro. Although talking boards, also called spirit boards, were originally intended to be a novelty toy and a lighthearted amusement, and they are still marketed as such, their use has evolved and they are sometimes used as a serious spiritual tool. In time, sinister stories became associated with the Ouija boards, and from that sprung urban legends and horror stories about demons, possession, and interdimensional portals. Baltimore has another interesting link to ghosts aside from Ouija board manufacturing. Edgar Allan Poe, the famous author of ghostly and macabre stories, called Baltimore home for a significant portion of his life. He met his untimely and mysterious death in Baltimore in 1849. Just a year before, he had a brief engagement with Sarah Helen Whitman, a fellow author as well as a spiritualist and medium. 
Poe is buried at the Westminster Burying Ground on West Fayette Street. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. It is easy to judge the frauds and charlatans taking advantage of people's fear and pain. However, we should respect that there were and are people whose belief that ghosts can speak to us from the other side is an important part of their spirituality. However, spiritualism also provided an unexpected benefit to society as a whole. It became an unusual tool for social reform. Spiritualism was a platform in which women were allowed to speak publicly, a novel event for the time. Women used this new arena and freedom to speak out on behalf of women's rights and called for social reforms. David K. Nartonis explains, quote, Across cultures, those whose natural voices have been suppressed have found speaking for the dead a powerful political tool because it derives authority from direct individual spiritual contact or experience rather than from office position or training. Thus, for a time, spiritualists were among the few American women allowed to speak in public. On this basis, they proclaimed women's rights, a more benevolent heaven than Orthodox ministers preached, and critiqued white male failings such as intemperance, solicitation of prostitution, and the ill treatment of women, children, blacks, and American Indians." End quote. Anne Broad and Alex Owen were two of the first researchers to point out the significance of the influential opportunity spiritualism and mediumship provided women of the time. Spiritualists were often strongly pro-abolitionists, a political stance that often did not sit well with Southerners at the time. However, this did allow for some organic melding of spiritualism and traditional African religions. Spiritualism faded from its heyday by the 1930s, but speaking with the dead never ceased completely. By the 1950s and 60s, channeling and the occult began to rise in popularity again. Today, spiritualism in many ways still exists, although traditional seances are not as popular, and ectoplasm has been basically reduced to a movie trope. However, the world seems to have embraced the growing trend of ghost hunting and paranormal investigation entertainment shows. At times, these shows have aspects of spiritualism, such as asking ghosts to make knocking noises and using the Ouija board. Many of these investigators attempt to use science to back up their claims by using technology to record changes in temperature and the electromagnetic fields and to capture images and sounds that are beyond human sensing ability. The 21st century has brought a new generation of both swindlers and believers. Technology has made it easier than ever before to fake ghostly experiences. Yet so many people have experienced the truly unexplainable and remarkable for themselves. Should we be so quick to dismiss the personal testimony of millions of people from across the world? The world is a noisy place. If a ghost were to speak to us from beyond the grave, would we be perceptive enough to even hear it? Could they be speaking to you now?